Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luan Nigara. Luann has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luann brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Welcome to another episode of Power Talk Friday on a well-designed business. I have Rob Greenlee with me today. Hi, Rob. How are you? Hi, Luann. It's great to be here. Well, I'm very happy that you accepted my invitation to be on this show because you're sort of like the godfather of podcasting, aren't you? <laughs> so for everybody out there that doesn't have a podcast, they may or may not be familiar with you, but I certainly am. And I'm going to share a little bit of your background. So Rob is currently head of podcast content at Spreaker.com, and that is a huge name in podcasting. I'm just going to tell you folks. And he is the the former executive vice president and chief technology officer at Podcast Network, PodcastOne.com, which was based in Beverly Hills, California. Rob is also the former content manager, podcast for Windows Phone, Zoom, and Xbox. And he currently co-hosts the new media show at Geek News Central Live every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So um, in addition to this, he is also the former founder and lead host of Web Talk World Radio Show and Zoom Insider Podcast. And the really cool thing is that Web Talk Radio was an eight-year running national syndicated terrestrial broadcast broadcast radio show, but it is the is recognized as the very first broadcast radio program in the world to begin podcasting, which was all the way back on September 15th, 2004. So for all my designer besties out there, you know, we're always talking about what is our only. Well, Rob's only is that he is the very first person to take a radio program and turn it into a podcast. So that's pretty exciting. And the thing is, you might be wondering why, you know, I'm indulging myself a little bit with talking to such a leader in the podcast industry. But I have to say, I'm sure just like me that you guys have noticed that interior design podcasts are truly popping up all over. Of course, we all know that Nick and I have been covering the business side of the industry on our podcast, but the consumer facing side has more and more interior designers, just like yourselves, joining the ranks of podcasters. Okay. A lot of interior designers are deciding and utilizing podcasting as a means to market their skills and their knowledge to their consumers in an effort to grow their businesses. Now, I have three previous guests who already had their own interior design design podcast by the time I interviewed them. You all know who they are. James Swan with Million Dollar Decorating, Amanda Gates, Designing 101, and Charmaine Winter, The Living Well Show. Oh, and there's a fourth, Marina Case from The Red Shutters with Style, The Style Show. And then just in this last year, 2016 to 17, six more of my previous guests who are interior designers have launched their own podcast. So we have Kimberly Selden, The Business of Design. We have Rachel Moriarty and Dixie Willard, with Design Plus Style. We have Cheryl Janice and Rhea Mater with the Wellness Design Podcast. And of course, my buddy Mark McDonough with Tastefully Inspired. Now, I have to say to you guys, this doesn't even take into account the dozen or other shows that have launched in the last year or two that I haven't even had the chance to interview or speak to yet. And these include the Design Pod from the Global Design Post, the Fixer Upper with Chip and Joanna Gaines, and How to Decorate from Ballard, like Ballard Design Catalog has a podcast now. I don't know if you knew that. So these podcasts are all consumer facing and they're all talking about the things that I don't talk about here, the pretty stuff. All right. But I wondered if any one person listening out there might be thinking about putting your toe into the podcast pool. And so Rob Greenlee, as I described, is a pioneer in this industry. And so he is going to indulge us a little bit as I pick his brain about where this field is heading and kind of to decipher a little bit of the ins and outs of it. I mean, because I'm going to tell you, I'm doing it a year and a half and I don't understand half of it, honestly. <laughs> so um, hi, Rob. I, thank you for hanging hi. in for all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate the, the nice uh, kind of kind of 
<laughs> kind of introduction. Yeah. That's it. So, so the thing is, um, I, I know in every industry, there's always a point that somebody says, oh, I would have loved to have done that, but it's too late, right? And so, of course, three years ago, it was definitely not too late. And for me, a year and a half ago, it was not too late. And I would venture to say it's still not too late. But I know people have said that to me. What are you, you're, you're doing this what are we talking 13, 14 years now, plus your radio background? What do you say to this? Is it too late? Is it like, oh my goodness, everybody and their brother's going to have a podcast? What What are your thoughts on that, Rob? Well, I think that the truth of the matter is, is that uh, it's, it's not too late. And some of the key reasons for that are, is that, uh, you know, the popularity of podcasts is still growing. Uh, it's only just a, uh, it's like maybe 30%, 40% of the U.S. population has even tried a podcast or listened to a podcast. So there's huge upside um, and content is what's going to bring people in as listeners. So uh, the the opportunity to create a terrific show and put it out there and market it and reach your niche audience is is greater than ever. I mean, more people know about podcasting now. Sure, there's a lot more shows now, but if you really look at um, how many shows that are out there, um, there's about 350,000 podcasts in iTunes today, uh, but only about half of those are actually active shows. Mm. So, so if you look on a global basis, it's about 150,000 shows. So as you think about how many potential um, audience members that you have um, to, to reach with your program... Uh, there's still a lot of undiscovered um, uh, listeners out there. So I I still think it's early days, and I believe that uh, it's still early for all those radio listeners to transition over to on-demand and podcasting. So I think that the future is bright, and the opportunity is still there. Yeah, so the thing about it is, for me, I can't even imagine. I, I, I will literally, major world events will happen, and I will come into the house at night and my husband will say to me, oh my goodness, did you hear what happened? And I'm like, no, because I was listening to podcasts all day. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just, I, I, I thankfully, you know, I'm, I'm not a complete like, you know, isolationist. I do read the newspaper every day, but, and I do listen to my husband, but I just, I can't even, I don't even have the patience any longer to listen to the regular commercial radio where A, the, every song is repeated 16 times in an hour and the yeah. news is the same 40 seconds of the same news 20 times in an hour. Now, I do love my NPR, I have to say. I would listen to Terry Gross all day long and Leonard Lopate. Um and Ira, right? Um, but I'm really looking forward to when I can get in my car and instead of having to upload from my phone and connect with Bluetooth, I can just like set all of my dials on my phone to, I mean, on my car to all of the podcasts that I love. I mean, that's coming, right, Rob? I mean, that is coming. Yeah, I mean, most of the technology is already here um, for what the future is going to hold for podcasting. It's just, it, it needs to be fully deployed and some of the bugs need to be worked out of it. I, I think seamless listening to audio content is going to easily transition between uh, your listening experience in your home uh, that will pass through your mobile device into your car, and then you'll listen in the car, and then it'll be easily passed um, to you as you go into work. So you, you'll have the opportunity to, to continuously listen to something that you're, you're interested in throughout the day or in various <clears throat> parts of your day. Um, so I think it's going to get easier, you know, on, on, like with the Amazon Alexa type of platforms, mm. those are going to be <clears throat> platforms that are going to make it easier for people to get access to, to, to this content and, um, are going to <clears throat> bring some capabilities that, um, that we haven't really seen yet, uh, really be fully deployed yet. Yeah, it really is. Uh, that's why I feel like I agree with you that that it's not too late because it does feel like even though when you do an iTunes search for interior design podcast and you come up with, you know, 25 or 30, that when you look at the list seems like a lot and seems like, oh, why should I bother? But when you think about it in the big picture is what you were describing, the number of people, 30% of all of the people are the only ones who are actively, you know, podcast listeners. That's 70% of the world that we have yet to reach, right? And yeah. and it, it, it is. So it is sort of like, it's not completely the Wild West, like when you started, right? But it's sort of the Wild West still. It's like, it's like that westward expansion. 
bench and go west young man come on west with us right, <laughs> right. well and it takes about you know 20 years or so to build a new media yeah. uh, i mean i mean look how long it took radio to build its its presence um i mean it, it's going to take a it's going to take probably another five or five to ten years before we see on demand our audio or podcasting to be fully deployed and and recognized by by huge numbers of population i mean Right now, we're we're already at about about a hundred million people that are consuming this media. So it isn't um, something that's small right. currently. There's still a lot of people engaged in it, but there's still a lot more people to to reach. And what the research is showing is that um, those that are 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 starting to listen to podcasts, they've kind of backed off on listening to radio, and they start listening to podcasts. They wind up getting sucked in. It's almost like a yeah. I like an addiction, right? right? They they want more and more and more because they realize that they can get what they want, and it, it basically empowers them. It's a much more personal medium, and you're a classic example of that. I mean, it's um, you talk to your your listeners like they're your friends, mm-hmm. and they look to you as a as a resource to help them in their career and what they're what they're doing in their lives. And they think of you as a friend. I mean, there, there's so many events that I go to where people will come up to me and say, "I've I've listened to your podcast <laughs> for years, and it's so great to meet you." I mean, I mean, what other medium can you really um, say that? I mean, those people feel connected to you because they've been in your ear in an earbud for however many episodes that they've been listening to you, and it's just such a powerful medium. It really is. And that experience, it's funny because this show is record, is going up, you know, several couple weeks after. But the reality is we're recording this the day after the big designer Liberty event that we had at Ethan Allen Flatiron in New York City last evening. And it's just as you said, I had at least half a dozen people come up to me and say, I, I listen to your podcast. I'm almost caught up with all the episodes and I just have learned so much from your show. And, and, and I'm looking at them going, oh my goodness, I know you from Instagram. I know you from Facebook. Yeah. And it is funny because you do feel like you know each other. And then the other side of it is, interestingly enough, we had Mikkel Welch as one of the panelists on the um, discussion last night, and he is the set designer. He was previously the set designer for the Steve Harvey show, and now he's currently the set designer for the Harry Connick show. In, uh, um, and so the thing was, in watching the Harry Connick show, one of the questions I asked Mikkel was, Harry Connick Jr. feels so sincere and feels so real and he had his wife on recently for this tribute for mother's day and his daughters were on the show another episode and he had his father on and i said to Mikkel, is harry like that in real life and it was funny because of course just to tell you in case you didn't hear it everybody he Mm -hmm. said yes that harry is as sweet and sincere in real life but it occurred to me that we often think that about TV personalities. Like I, I love Oprah and I've always thought, I really hope she is as nice as she is. And she seems because I would be heartbroken to find out that if I ever met her, she wasn't nice. Right. But why yeah. is it that we, I don't think that I've ever thought that way about a podcaster. Like, I feel like is, am I crazy or is it just me? Cause I am exactly the way I am. I'm telling you right now, this is who I am. And if you meet me, that's who I am. But is it, is that just specific to me or do you find that podcasting is just a little less behind the curtain? And then as podcasters, we are free to really just be who we are, where we understand that a TV personality might not be like who they are. What, what do you, I never thought about that until like today. Well, I think it depends on the person. I think that's that's the key. I I think that if you're a good actor, you can probably portray something in a podcast that uh, isn't authentic to you. But but I think uh, people can tell. I, I think uh, and those those programs tend to be I, I believe less successful because mm. there's a genuineness that comes from actually being genuine. And and unless you're a very talented actor, <clears throat> it's probably very difficult to pull it off to to act like something that you're not right now. If, if you're an actor and you're reading a script, yeah. It, it, and you Good have to per- yeah. portray something in a certain way that may not be who your, your real person is, then, 
then yeah, I can see it happening. Right. Good distinction because I'm me I'm mentioning all basically talk show hosts, and of course they are performing as themselves, even though it's a performance. Whereas the other is the other thing where you know I don't know X Y Z you know starlet mm -hmm. is acting like the the greatest daughter on the world on a TV series, but in real life she's a raving lunatic. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Especially in Hollywood, right? Exactly. That's, okay. That's the reputation down there. I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's true. <laughs> So, okay. All right. So anyway, so let's talk about this then. So it really is a very viable marketing arm for any person's business. Of course, it is a heck of a lot more labor intensive than just calling up a magazine and ordering four months worth of advertising, I have to say. Um, but it does, what it is, is it sort of is more work and more probably more money to do if you're going to do it well um but the return is probably i don't know the, the the word greater isn't really right but i guess what it is is you really as opposed to the most beautiful ad an interior designer can have a stunning room that they've beautifully executed run an ad in a shelter magazine and dozens and hundreds and thousands of people can see it, admire it, but they still don't look at that and know if they would like to work with that designer from a personal mm -hmm. standpoint. And so that's what podcasting does. It brings you as a person into somebody's awareness of what it really would be like to work with you, right? Yeah. And it's, it's about building trust. It's mm -hmm. about building a a trusted relationship and that's what you're doing in your podcast if you do it in, in a way that fosters that and i think that's that's the key to doing doing a terrific podcast is to is to give before you receive and that's that that's what it's really all about and that's what online media has kind of transitioned to is that you have to offer value before you can expect value right and and that that exchange is at the at the foundation of this medium is that you have to um, to connect with people, you have to help them, and then thus they will connect with you at a deeper level. And if if you don't somehow do that, then you're you're not going to build a, an audience that has value to you and your your business, and you're not going to be as as um, uh, respected by, by by the community too. So there's this kind of exchange that happens that's built on authenticity and trust. That's that's really at the core of this medium. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is, is it starts with what, you know, giving something to the, your audience starts with having terrific content. It starts with yep. really thinking about what types of things that you're going to help them with, what problems you're going to solve for them and what new things and ideas that you can bring to them that will enhance them in their life. So for interior designers, they could, you know, launch series on, you know, it's tougher though, because, you know, well, and of course we talked a little off air about how things are sliding into the video platform. So, mm -hmm. um, my friend, Mark McDonough at Tastefully Inspired, honest to God, about every 10 days, he either calls me or emails me or texts me or Instagram messages me and says, when are you going to make your, your podcast video? <laughs> and I yeah. just keep saying, you know, Mark, I don't like, I, I, it's just, it's a whole nother thing to learn. And so, but the point is for an interior designer, they there are many successful interior design podcasts that are not video, but they are somehow finding a way to express value and express content to their end user listener by description and by teaching, you know, mm -hmm. what they're doing. And they shouldn't be afraid, Rob, to teach their best design principles, their de best design habits and tricks and tips for fear that someone will go out and do it without them because the show reaches all over and lots of people are going to go do it without them. But then you always connect with the person that just is so happy and impressed by your knowledge and is happy to hire you. Correct? Yeah. And, and I think design is, is an art form, right? You can share um, your conceptual aspects of it, but I, I, I believe, you know, your unique, um, perspective on it um, is very difficult to for another person to duplicate um, so that expertise that you have to create almost like creating art is unique to each individual and so you're you're basically sharing the concepts that have to be 
um, thought about in order to, to for that person to create their own unique perspective. But maybe they really like your perspective on it, and that's what they want in their home, or that's what they want to experience, and that's what you're connecting up there. Um, is is your uniqueness is what what attracts that listener to connect with you around your design and your creative uh, thought, and that's what it could could it could and should be shared in your podcast. Right, and what happens, you know, the way the world is, just like the podcast is this crazy technology, so many interior designers now are getting into e-design. So no longer is it that, well, what would be the point of having a podcast that's listened to internationally and nationally when they're not you know, any chance of them being potential clients. But with eDesign, they certainly could be. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that Amanda Gates, she's uh, very, very knowledgeable about feng shui, and she will often, her programs will revolve around a topic of that where she really teaches people the principles of maybe mm -hmm. each one show might be a specific principle about it or a discussion about it, or she does a lot of talk about organic and organic design and different ways, you know, in your home to be um, you know, pesticide free and, you know, all of that stuff. And, and so on one hand, it's sort of like, well, how is that related to interior design? But on the other hand, when she has the different discussions about your organic lifestyle, but then a third or fourth episode is about the feng shui or something, you really are just learning her values, right? Her core values, what she stands yep. for as a person. And that's what you're describing. So mm -hmm. she, 10 people could talk about feng shui, but Amanda's slant on it is different. And we learn that through her podcast. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I very... think that's that, that, that's key, and that's probably why you're seeing a, a, a growth in designer themed and topic podcasts because it is unique to each designer, and in in an opportunity for people to learn from that design process and design thinking, and and I think audio can can play a role here. But you were talking earlier about video and video's role here too, and we talked about this too earlier, but. Um, but the visual aspect is very important to those involved in design as well. So I can see where video could have a role here, and maybe it's a supplemental role mm -hmm. um, that can add some more depth and character and connection to your audience using YouTube and a, a webcam and maybe being able to show some of these visual things um, as a supplement to your audio podcast. Mm -hmm. And it's... Um... You know, it's the sort of thing where I, I am so focused as a person individually on results. I, there's very few, I just don't find that I have a lot of sitting around time and I don't have a lot of, well, whatever, you know, and I'll get to that yeah. and whenever, right? So I approach the podcast that way too. I feel like if I'm going to have a conversation with somebody, what am I getting out of it? And what am I helping my listeners get out of it? Because if there's no uh, about it. I, I've, I've sometimes spent 10 minutes, 15 minutes before recording with a designer that's going to be on the show and really figuring out what is something that they do very well in their business that we could teach to the designers listening. Because um, I, I, I guess for me, I'm any podcast I listen to, I want to be done at the end of it and go and have an idea. Just even I, my criteria is one idea, one thing that makes me go, huh, I didn't think about that. Now, sometime yeah. I'm sitting there with a pen and paper and writing down 20 ideas and I'm exhausted when the show is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, you know. the score, right, on that one because exactly. you've got lots of ideas. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I listen to, you know, Amy Porterfield or somebody. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> I don't have time in a day for this. You know what yeah. I mean? But, I mean, do you agree? Is that is that just – that's what I was, was asking there. Is that just me because I'm – results orientated into I'm so hot. I've had such a hard time with that word uh, <laughs> but or is that podcasting in general are there do you, your experience because I wouldn't even know the podcasts out there that are not out to teach something because I, I wouldn't dra gravitate to them but there are or so from a da standpoint of an interior designer would they be best served if they thought of like when we do a blog post or we do mm -hmm. a storyboard for a client we kind of think about our 
solution first, and then we want to figure out how we're going to get to that solution. And that's what I approach the podcast with. What am I trying to express here in this podcast to my colleagues out there? So do you believe that that's the best way if you're also using it as a marketing uh, arm of your business? Or even if a one person's style is to simply just talk and share, that will resonate with somebody and it will be just fine. What do you think about that? If we're trying to use it as a marketing arm? Yeah, I think just uh, sharing your your process uh, of how you think through these these um, I don't know if they I would call them problems, but they are in a way they're they're trying to come up with a solution that's um, that, that that works with something else. I I mean I, I I'm not a designer my, my, myself, but <laughs> I've I've worked with a lot of um, um, content creators and how they think about how they present their content. And you had mentioned earlier a l- little bit about, um, are there podcasts out there that, um, that don't do this right. Or don't go through this process. Right, they and just I, put I, on the mic and go. Start yeah. Talking. I would say that, that there's a lot of shows out there that, um, that are comedy shows or that mm. they're just silly talk shows. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, ways that you can approach this. I mean, um, you know, most of the shows that I do are pretty serious shows, mm-hmm. uh, because I'm not a comedian, <laughs> but, but, it, but you can certainly, if you happen to be a comedian and a designer, you can certainly, um, bring that aspect to it as well. You can, you can, you know, there's something very appealing about, um, and a show that has some entertainment in it, right. uh, or some humor or some, some other ways of approaching the content creation process, okay. um, and and to to add some spice and some character, maybe you go out and you you go into someone's home and you talk about their their design in their home, and you actually bring the microphone with you and you talk to that person as they walk through their home, um, and that that designer you know explains what they did in this room and and those kind of things. So you can create these kind of like these scenescapes of experience, right? And trying to but, but but that does shift a lot of responsibility over to the the host and the guest to be able to to inspire that listener to have a visual experience through audio. Right, and, right. And, and that is a fairly unique talent to be able to do that. I mean, you have to be able to use words that are, that are very descriptive and very visually stimulating. Right. And that's not always easy to do, but but it is possible. Yes, and I guess the other thing too is that the we talk about it on this podcast all the time, the value of an interior designer in niching their design firm as 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 narrowly as they can so that they draw in a potential client even if they are capable of doing a broader design that the niche can draw that consumer into them and then they can later express to that consumer hey you know i you found me because i'm an expert at feng shui master bedroom design yeah. but guess what i i can do your kitchen too you know and vice yeah, versa yeah. so the thing with podcasting is it's the same premise if a designer is listening and they take a look at all the different podcasts that are available that are consumer facing to the industry now. You know, they should. Uh, would you agree? I, I, I mean, I, this is what I would think, and you tell me what you think. I would think that they would look at the offerings that are there and compare and contrast them to their skill set, what their knowledge set is, and then just figure out a way to wiggle out a different perspective that they yeah. can own, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's key to to try and um, find a unique angle that isn't being done by other others out there. Mm-hmm. But I do think of looking at design, I think you inherently have a unique perspective, right. and and that that enables you to to always be unique in your show. But you should also think about ways that you can more logistically be unique as well i mean how you present the content what's the what's the format uh, maybe you have a show that maybe involves the audience more mm-hmm. um, by by uh, by having some segment in the program that addresses their questions and you like i did my uh speaker live show just yesterday and the whole show that that i did was all about um comments and questions that came from the listeners mm. i i 
I looked at them and said, I'm going to do a show about everything that they were having a question about or their their interest. It wasn't all coming from me as the host. I was taking their questions and ma- building a show around that. And then next week I can come up with my own topics and, and dive back into important things that I think are important. But but I think that balance between thinking about your, your audience and your listeners is another key element here that can make your show connect at a much deeper level with its audience and maybe get more comments and emails and contribution to the show, just like the early days of talk radio where, where people would call in and you'd have a conversation with them on the program. You can still do that with a podcast. Right. Right. I know. I, I've heard of speak pipe and different devices that I randomly contemplate and then I get insanely busy and <laughs> it just remo- yeah. remains as a little like, you know, list in one of those notebooks, but um, where there's a device called speak pipe. And I'm, I guess you yeah. probably know of others where a guest or a listener, I mean to say, could call up, record that question, and then there's mm-hmm. a way for me to edit that into the program so that I, instead of just saying a listener asked this question, you could hear the listener ask it, right? Yeah. Or, or it can just be an email and you just read the, right. the high points of the email and then you address their questions on, on the show itself. And, it, and you, you would be surprised how many other people that helps because oftentimes those questions are questions that a large group of people are thinking about your show from a prior episode. Right. So so you're coming into it and you're addressing those questions that come up from a subset of your listeners and that will in- inspire other listeners to think, well, I can do the same thing. I had the same question or concern. I'm going to um, contribute that too and create a segment in your program where you address that communication that happens with mm. your listeners. Yes, we just in the last month put a new email that's questions at windowworksnj.com specifically mm-hmm. for that purpose because I, you know they were coming at me from all different angles. They were coming at me from Instagram and Facebook and the, the Windowworks business email yep. and I just – you know, can't keep track of it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's a lot. And you as a host need to prioritize which ones you think are the most uh, important to address on the program because they'll be helpful to the largest number of listeners. Yes. And so, and I I dream about the day of having a dedicated admin just to the podcast so that I can just say, Hey, what are our questions today? Just put them on my desk for the show. (laughs) Not quite there yet. (laughs) No, no, no. You still have to do the the manual work of reading them all and filtering them and deciding them, which ones. remembering yeah. they're there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ex- Putting it in the notes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And then the record button goes off. I'm like, darn it, I forgot right. to mention this. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But I'll get to it next week. I know, yeah. I know. Well, my editors are great for that. She, my one editor is my, my Aunt Gretchen. Every most A lot of people have met my editors, my Uncle Bill and Aunt Gretchen, and they are professional audio and video editors for more than 30 years. And so it was my great fortune when I decided to do this podcast. Of course, I went right to them. I'm like, would you guys be my editors? And um, she, my Aunt Gretchen catches so much. She'll be like, you know, Lou, you said in last week's outro that this was going to happen, and I don't see that when it happened. I'm like, really? I did? You know? <laughs> So she keeps me straight. So it's terrific. That's great. But it takes a village, just like everything else, just like our interior design businesses, you know, my window treatment business. It's if you decide and you think that you might like to launch a podcast, it's there's a lot that goes into it, but it starts with your unique perspective. What are you bringing to it that's different than somebody else? And what we discussed is your actual talent and knowledge base is always going to be different than another interior designers because there's the you factor of you, you yourself, right? And then also you were mentioning, Rob, that not only is the difference, the you that you bring to it. But even if somebody out there, let's use the feng shui example, even if there was a a program that was specifically feng shui, not only are you going to have a different aspect on it, which is what we just said, but secondly, you also said, well, you can just approach the show layout differently. The setup Mm -hmm. of the show could be different. And that would be something that would appeal to one person more than another person. And that's how you find your loyal tribe. And then the other thing is, I would say, tell me what you think about it is, is that consistency is of greater value than the number of shows that you do. What do you think about that, Rob? Yeah, I, I, the numbers bear out that consistent production of of uh, shows 
builds an audience. Um, if you take long breaks um, between between episodes, and when I say long breaks, I'm talking about you know a, a month or more mm. or something like that. You do tend to lose audience because people uh, people are uh, consume your program on on a habit. Right. I mean, it's a pattern that they've built into their lives. They 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 look forward to your episode when, when, when it comes out if they know when it's going to come out and it's there. They can plan for it, and I think it's really important to to do that. I I notice that your show here is uh, like every couple of days, and, yeah. and I think people people can um, kind of plan for that. They can say, well, you know, I I love Luann, and I want to listen to the Well Designed um, Business podcast, and and I know it's going to come out on Monday and Wednesday, Wednesday and Friday, or something yep. like that, right? Yep. Um, and, and they can count on that and they can build that into their calendar and their schedule to always listen to your show. But they also are going to be picky about which episodes they listen to and which ones that they don't based right. on the topic and the guest. Right. So, so people will have like five or six different uh, podcasts that they subscribe to or they follow and they'll, they'll listen to episodes. They'll bounce back and forth to listening to different episodes based on the topic and the guest. Um, not every listener will listen to every episode, but you can kind of see a pattern that, that happens if you look at your stats where um, if your numbers are very consistent, are fairly consistent across many episodes over a subsequent period of time, you'll know that you have a solid built-in listener base. That's listening and, to mostly every show, you mean. Correct, yes. correct. But you'll see some episodes will be higher right. and some will be kind of like back at your normal level. And those will be guests that maybe had have a following right. to their, their kind of topic that they have brought to your show. And you'll see a bump in that or you had a, a feature or a promotion on some platform that it was featuring your show based on that guest. Um, and so you'll see these patterns that will happen, but you'll over a period of time you will build – a loyal base of listeners that will come back and listen to your, or at least download your program every single week. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they listen, actually, you don't really know because once it gets downloaded, th there's no metric tracking system that will report whether or not a listener actually listened to that audio file once it's been downloaded. And iTunes is the culprit in this. There's no reporting mechanism back to the platform of actual listens. It only reports... Um, typically, at least coming through downloads, that it was downloaded. Right. So, so they could download yeah. it, not listen, download, listen to one minute, or you know, and Correct. it records it the same as it would. It means the same in our stats as if somebody listened to the whole hour. Correct. Yes. So yeah. I, you said something in there that I want to go back to because it's something that I struggle with when because I am a, a podcast listener in the w one way that you described where the shows that I love I will listen to them based on titles so for instance I, once I've lost launched my podcast I have so much less time to listen to podcasts than I did previously because now I'm <laughs> you know busy editing my own and proofing yeah. it and you know everything else and so there's only so much time in a day but I do have my favorites that I go back to and what I find now is much like what you said, where a year and a half ago, I just put it on every morning when I know that show is coming on and that's it. And now it's like, oh, I haven't listened in two weeks. What are the titles? And so I struggle with that because again, I, I feel like that I might be I wonder sometimes if I have, again, this difference from my typical, my typical listener. I feel like I'm, I could be a little bit more cutthroat and a little bit more cut and dry about things about stuff like this. So for instance, when I'm going through my favorite podcast that I listen to, I want the title in my face. I want it to say Facebook marketing. I want it to say, you know, yep. blah, blah, blah. But what I struggle with my podcast is you know, my, my buddies out there are highly aesthetic people. They're highly inspirational people. They're people that appreciate uh, beautiful things. And to me, that translates to the word as well. And so I struggle with finding 
titles mm -hmm. that describe yeah. the business aspect that my listener is going to learn, but still s seem beautiful and aspirational. So what is, you know, and I've, part of me has just felt like, you know, just go to today. It's Facebook today. It's this, but what do you think? Do you think that I'm better served and my listeners are better served if I keep trying to straddle, putting a little teaser of what the, t what the content is, but making it sound, you know, more like a beautiful title of a, of a, you know, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I mean, one of the things, I mean, you just think about it from a marketing perspective, um, first of all, and it's also, you're, you're oftentimes dealing with a very limited amount of space. I mean, yeah. uh, I'm looking at your show on a page that's pulled off of Apple and the, the iTunes platform. And I, I see a column with the name and the description and the release date. And that's, that's, that's what, it. that's typically what yep. the listener sees, right? So so you need to really think about what you put there mm -hmm. as 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 a hook, right? To That's get the thing. It's, to, it's the hook. To right. click on it, right? I right. mean, your last last show, the episode 179, at least that, that that's the one that's in, in front of me right now. It lists the name of your guest right first. Right. But we don't know what they what you talked about. What was the topic? And and unless that <clears throat> guest has a very familiar name, right that listener is not going to know what the topic of that was. Um, so you might <clears throat> think about it is that if that guest is very well known to your audience, then I would put the name in there. If the, if the topic is more important than the guest name, then I would put the topic in there. Um, okay. So what I but, have done is I have, I think by the third or fourth show, I switch to every show starts with the guest name and then goes to the, you know, the topic. So like 179 is Lynn K. Leonidas and is a set. And then what all that I can see in iTunes is establish your intentions and create, you know, and then the rest is dot, dot, dot. I have to click on it to read, yeah. you know what I mean? So I just thought that that created some sort of continuity in the presentation but you think yeah. that switch i it, there's no reason for that i can switch it up based on this guest isn't as as known but the what the topic we're talking about is more of a pain point for a typical designer so put that first yeah i mean hmm. what would you put down at the i mean think about it from this perspective if you were a newspaper editor and there there was a article below what would the title of that article be and it it can only be like 20 characters or 25 characters what would that be to describe what was in there as a hook right um is kind of how you have to look at it. And you kind of have to look at your cover out art and album art too. Mm -hmm. That's typically the first thing that a potential listener sees is your cover art and your album art. Right. So, so it needs to be colorful. It needs to communicate what your show's about, but it also has to be in bold text because oftentimes that image is um, displayed in a very small size on a mobile phone or a, or a, player device right. um so that text needs to be able to still be readable at, at a 75 pixel by 75 pixel size right. um so it, which is going to be a challenge i mean these are challenging issues but they're but they're very important to to try and get right and th there's no harm in um, updating your cover art and updating your your description and making these changes as you evolve your program and make it more refined and make it better as you learn from your audience and as you learn um, and see what others are, are are doing and you can evolve what you're doing as you evolve your brand and your your own presence in, in your show those things need to adapt to that as well yeah, I, I like all those suggestions because if anybody is thinking about, you know, jumping in and probably, you know, maybe launching a podcast, I would say based on what you just said combined with my own experience is – you're not going to have it all figured out day one. You're just not. No, you're not. And you're not so going to have just, a lot of listeners from day one either. Right, so just jump <laughs> in. Just do it. If you're inclined to, just jump in and do it. And as you said, you know, certain things, I did happen to take a lot of time with my cover art. And you know what? I could have 20 experts tell me they don't like it. I don't care. I love it. <laughs> no, I think it's great. Oh, and I didn't mean that you didn't, they didn't like it. Oh, I'm just no. saying in general. <laughs> no, I think you did a good job, uh, <laughs> with your cover art i think it's, no it's i didn't think you were it's saying colorful. that i didn't <laughs> yeah no, no i think it's good 
but there are certain things that are just so like that are just to me I just see it it's just non to go like that's it and there are 20 things where I'll ask Kimberly's opinion I'll ask different coaches that I work with I'll ask my husband but they're just like that cover art I went round and around and I when I went and I ended up designing it on my dining room table and sending it to the graphic artist I'm like this is what I want you know and so I love it and it speaks to me but I do what I where I was actually going with that is if you are struggling with any aspect, whether it's your cover art or it's your format or it's to have a guest host or, you know, a co-host or not, or if it's to do solo or do interview style, just do it. And as you find your voice and as it becomes clear to you, what is your comfort zone, you can change it. And that's what you're saying. I mean, you know what I, I remember? I always think about when you look in advertising and marketing and you look at the way the big companies, whether it's Coca-Cola or whoever else comes to mind, how their logos have morphed over the years. Mm -hmm. It's and, and so when you think about that, then you go, OK, I don't have to know everything in order to do this. And and that's really what I'm sharing in, in piggybacking yeah. on your sentiment, because what I know now compared to what I knew, I know I knew a year and a half ago is light years. And, you know, if anybody had the conversation before Rob and I started recording, the questions I asked them are like sound like they come from, a, you know, a first minute podcast or there's still so much that I don't know. Yeah. But, hey, just move along. And as it gets better and I learn more or if you're doing it and you learn more, it's sort of like the analogy is that. If you can think back to the day you graduated interior design school, whether that was, you know, one month ago, one year ago, 10 years ago, you know more now than you did then. But it didn't mean that you weren't an interior designer and it didn't mean that you weren't qualified to do whatever that first job was or open your firm when that time came, that you're always going to learn, you're always going to evolve and it's okay to learn as you go, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. And and that's how all of us go, go through life. So mm -hmm. it's it's not a, you know, you're never done. You're always kind of trying to improve and make things better. And that's, that's essentially what you're doing. And that's how you build a podcast. That's mm -hmm. how you build a successful shows. It's one step at a time. There are very few shows that launch and have instant success that, that only happens typically to, to, uh, show creators that have a huge following uh, right. from e either other media or, um, have just a huge reputation in a particular field that uh, they launch a show and everybody pays attention. Right. Um, but but you still have to get the word out to that community. Um, and sometimes that takes some time to actually do that, e even if you're a very popular person. I I've seen a, quite a few celebrity podcasts launch, uh, you know, back when I was working for Podcast One. Uh, and not every celebrity gets instant success in this either because – just like what you were talking about earlier, sometimes they, th those personalities, those real personalities are really not that great. You know? <laughs> so, so it, I mean, they're great if they have a great script, but they're not great if they're having to talk as a normal human being. So, yes. so just because you're a celebrity and you have a following doesn't mean that that's going to translate to being a successful podcaster. Right. Um, because those are skills that um, are unique to, to an individual and it depends on your focus on other people and not just yourself, too. Well, and the thing is, too, I think probably some of the fear that comes into this that is different from other things. Like, for instance, I made the analogy of what you knew as a graduating interior designer compared to what you know five or ten years later. And the difference, I think, is that we understand as business people that we're going to evolve and we're going to learn and we're going to grow and we're going to be more expert as every year goes by on our particular industry or our business, what we're running. But we, there isn't a live record of what it was that we said or did in that first yeah. year. And so in podcasting, it's different. And I have to tell you, I recently, well, maybe it was about, 
I don't know, two months ago, one of my uh, listeners that has become a friend of mine, Kylie, mentioned to me that she is, she didn't find the show at the beginning. I think she found it in the fall or something. And she mentioned to me that she was going backwards. She listened from the one that released and is going backwards. And I was like, oh, could you stop at like about 10? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want them to go back too far, yeah, right? I, I yeah, can't yeah. even bear to listen. And the th- sin of it is some of my, my, my true designer or friends that are friends of mine are in those first episodes but because of course that's where I went in the beginning like hey you're my friend could you do the show but I still can't even bear and I might listen to it and find that they're fine but I just know the difference between the sea legs of the first six seven eight <laughs> shows between the ones after that and in my mind mentally I'm like I don't even want to listen to it <laughs> so well and there's no shame in maybe taking down those th- those very early episodes because they're, they're probably not going to be listened to that much anyway well you so. know what's so funny though yeah. the very first show is with Heather McManus who has also since become a friend and she really was so terrific on that first show and she, with the two of us helped our way through do you know that that show has like nearly four thousand listens it's one of the most highly listened to show wow that's yeah, interesting it's crazy it's yeah. so crazy it's yeah, like it's, i mean it can i mean if it can happen it it'll happen to you and you have no idea you know it's yeah. just it, it's hard to predict what happens when, when you open this box of opportunity like yeah. this it's um yeah i mean i've I've seen that happen too. My Spreaker Live show, my very first episode, which was just a, a promo teaser, it was like maybe 35, 40 seconds long, yeah. uh, has had as many downloads as my most popular show. Yeah. So it's like people were like checking out, well, what's this? You know? Yes. And, well, and yeah. it's funny because I guess I've looked at it a lot of times not to take anything away from Heather whatsoever, but I've looked about, at it and thought, well, I guess when you hear about the show, you go back and you start with the first show, but then maybe you don't necessarily go to the second. You then look for a name that you know, but I don't know, but it's just funny. And really the the only point is that, um, I think that, again, as I said, if you're thinking that you might like to do it, there is a little bit of, you know, trepidation surrounding the fact that even though we all say that you can learn and change and grow as you do it, we're all completely aware that it's there for all of time and posterity for somebody to listen to. <laughs> but you got to move on from that, too. And I no. really just push through it. I was because one of the no. things is if you do decide that you think you might be an interior designer who might like to launch a podcast is you're going to start now doing research on it, which is what I'm going to suggest that you do. You start listening listening to all the shows that teach you how to podcast. So you, you know, they have a school of podcasting with Dave Jackson and you have Eric Johnson and uh, the talent coach. And of course, um, you know, there's dozens of people that teach you how to podcast. And one of the things that I remember hearing over and over was exactly that. You're probably not going to like your first half dozen or so shows, and you're not going to be any different than anybody else in that regard. And, you can't wait until you feel good at in order to do it. I remember thinking that I would practice interviewing people. I remember because I hear this, you know, oh, you're not going to like your first half dozen shows. And I thought, well, that's just crazy. Why don't I practice interview, you know, 10 of my friends and family? And then that way, when I get to the first show, that the first 10 shows, nobody will hurt. But it's different. You Having a conversation with somebody that's not really, a, you know, that exact podcast conversation. I, I did it with my mom a couple of times and I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm not, I'm not afraid. I'm not nervous. I have no goosebumps. <laughs> You're my mom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just, you just have to do it. And I'm a big believer in that if you're listening and speaking to somebody and getting their advice because you recognize their value as an expert in that industry, then just take the advice. And so that was what I did. And so I'm just sharing that with all of you that here's Rob. He's been podcasting since 2004 and, you know, me for just a year and a half. And the truth is that if you're interested in doing it, it's a wild ride. It's tons of fun on one hand. It's a ton of work on another hand. But if you if you do it with passion and authenticity and you really help to solve your consumer problems and challenges, you know, it could be a, a nice little device for you to, you know, expand your interior design firm, right? Yeah, I think it, it 
it basically turns you into uh, you know an expert in your field. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. especially you bring on guests. Um, you as a host, you're you're learning a lot. Oh I mean, yes. I did a show for many years, my radio show, where I had guests. I had up to three guests every show that I did, wow. and and it just learned so much so fast from those yes, guests. And it made truth. me a better a better expert in you know talking about the world World Wide Web and the internet, and then that translated into writing articles for newspapers and going on other media too, other mm. radio shows and TV shows and doing all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so. It's also an education process for you as a creator doing right. these type of programs too. It's Very definitely powerful. true. I have learned many things from the guests over the past year, and we've instituted, brought many of those those uh, concepts and practices to WindowWorks. And WindowWorks is a thirty plus yep. year company. And I would come in the door and be like, "This is an awesome idea," you know. And the other thing <laughs> I learned, it's funny, is I've learned that we have done a lot of things that quote unquote have names for it out there that we were just like, this is how we do this. <laughs> and so that yeah. was, that's been sort of fun too. You know, um, I don't know. I, we just had a show recently with Michelle Williams, uh, for, uh, she's a profit first certified coach. And I don't know if you know, Mike Mikulowski, Mikowski, right. He's got that. He wrote the book and then he has the podcast profit first. And uh, oh, it's interesting. It's really cool. And he talks about how if you're running a business that you have to take your money out first as the business owner, like that has to happen. Like it's not a hobby, make money, right? And so what was so interesting was I heard him on Natalie Ekdahl's podcast, The Biz Chicks. And then of course, I started to listen to his podcast a little bit. And then I looked into it. And then of course, you know, everybody who listens, you don't know this, but everybody else who listens knows that my husband runs the finance end of our business. So I come running up to my husband, like, you got to get this concept. Like, I know that we are making profit and I know that we've got this locked down, but this is sort of in the, and what he does is he advocates that your money goes into up to five or six different bank accounts, a portion to weigh your, your, what you're doing and you just take it in and it goes to operating accounts and, you know, profit accounts and la la la. Right. And it's, it's detailed, but that's the gist of it. And I'm like telling my husband all this. He's like, you know what, Luann, I love you. He goes, you know what? You just come in here, you hover around with the big ideas and you sell your stuff and you do the things that you do and you really don't have any idea how we do the back end, do you? I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, we have four bank accounts. I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm like, you're a rock star. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's that's great that you have that. Yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. So so yeah. I have learned a lot, but then also I have found that things that have names that we already do. <laughs> yeah. So it's that's fun. Great. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. But it is. And that is another particularly interesting aspect of it is the connections that you make and the lessons that you yourself learn from having the podcast. And those are other tangible benefits from uh, going into this field. So I mean, I honestly, Rob, I thank you so much for taking your time because between the couple of shows that you do and your the leader you are in the industry, I know that my little baby podcast isn't really top on the list here, but I do appreciate that you came and spoke to us because I really have noticed this big trend. I mean, even in a, a year and a half, I told you how many yeah. of my guests have launched a podcast in a year in this little industry, this niche industry. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, there's others out there thinking about doing it. So I I really appreciate your coming and sharing your perspective with us on this. Well, thank you for the opportunity to join you on your your show. This is your life passion, and I feel honored to to join you on here. And and it's a you know I get to meet another terrific person, and <laughs> thank that's you. that that's really awesome for me. And that, that that's one of the things that I get out of being a podcaster mm. is that all the great people that I meet that are great communicators and great marketers and. And great, uh, just you know, business people, and and it's just powerful, and they're just good people. So, uh, it's always a win for me anytime I can join someone's podcast. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. This podcast is a production of WindowWorks in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about WindowWorks at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events.